Thank you for joining us for our very first video edition of Jackman Radio. I'm your host, Eric Jackman. I'm your host, Mike Jackman. And tonight, we're excited to sit down with Green Party candidate for president, Dr. Jill Stein. Jill Stein ran for president in 2012 under the Green Party banner and received almost half a million votes, the most amount of votes by any woman ever seeking the presidency in the United States. Too often, people in this country say that they're going to choose the lesser of two evils and only believe that they have two choices for president, Democrat or Republican. But that's simply not the case. The Green Party is the fourth largest political party in the United States and achieved ballot access in close to 40 states in the 2012 election, theoretically having enough to win the 270 electoral votes you need to become president. Right now, the Green Party and the Libertarian Party are joined forces together in a lawsuit to sue the Commission on Presidential Debates for inclusion in next fall's general election debates, which will feature the Democrat and the Republican. And we're going we're gonna to ask Jill about her campaign, her vision for America, and what the Green Party is going to do to get into the debates. So we hope you guys enjoy this special video edition of Jackman Radio. All right, Jill. Well, hey, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's an honor to be, be with yeah. you. So uh, talk to me about the campaign and some of the differences between the last time you ran in 2012 and kind of some new tactics you're going to use and, and how things are going. Great. You know, I think the difference between um, 2016 and 2012, maybe the biggest difference is that we've been proven right. You know, everything we were talking about, that we desperately need jobs, we need to stop the... Uh, these endless, ever-expanding, immoral wars that are bankrupting us at home and making us less secure abroad. We need to protect our civil liberties, um, the rights of immigrants, uh, the, the stealing of our public schools. They're co-opting into basically resources for a private education industry. You know, you name it across the board. Uh, the climate crisis. Back in 2012, you know, we were saying it was time to stand up for what we deserve and not buy into this uh, politics of fear that told so many people you gotta, you gotta vote for the lesser evil because um, that's all you can get and that's all you can deserve. And in fact, what we've seen is that the lesser evil actually, or let me put it this way, the politics of fear delivered everything we were afraid of. All those reasons people were told to just like swallow your, you know, your voice and silence yourself because you didn't want a president that was going to expand the wars. You didn't want a president that was going to ship our jobs overseas, that was going to lower our wages here at home, that was going to give us uh, corporate health care, that um, was going to expand the wars and attack our civil liberties. Right. That's why you had to do the lesser evil thing. But that's exactly what we got with the lesser evil thing. So, you know, we're saying it's time to stand up, uh, forget the lesser evil, and fight like hell for the greater good. Sure. And as far as strategy goes, I mean, what did you learn from 2012 that you're kind of tinkering with now and doing differently? What's kind of going to be the strategy to get out there and be more well known? Yeah. Um, well, first, we're building on, you know, what we did in 2012, so we don't have to sort of establish our legitimacy. So, you know, we've got a jump start, a really good jump start. We also started a whole lot earlier so that we could yeah. begin to fight the battle, the battle of getting on the ballot, which is a huge battle to kind of get past that blockade oh, yeah. against so expensive challengers. And, and having lawyers, and I mean, in uh, 2012, so you got four, about 457,000 votes. And, and how many states were the Green Party on the ballot in? Well, I can tell you that we were on the ballot for about 85% of 85%. voters. I don't remember exactly what the number is. I think it's it was enough around to get the 270 40. electoral votes. That's to be right. President. That's so right. We're on the ballot and enough to be president. Exactly, and on the ballot enough that the vo voters deserve to know right. that we were a choice, which gets into the whole issue of the debates as a tool, basically, of misleading voters into thinking that they only have two choices. So yeah. we're fighting the debates now, and that's another difference that we're uh, we have two court cases. We have a petition, which is up at our website, and we encourage listeners to go to jill2016.com, sign the petition, tell your friends about it, because we have a right to vote, but we also have a right to know who we can vote for. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, you know, it's, they're almost like thugs running the show. Um, I was reading you were actually arrested on um, 
October of 2012, trying to go to Rutgers for a debate? Or Hofstra? Or, or it Hofstra. was Hofstra, Hofstra University. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What, was the, uh, what was the story behind that? What was that experience like? Well, you know, we were on the ballot for most voters, and we thought it was an outrage that we were being excluded from the debate, so we wanted to at least go and listen to the debate. Yeah. So just trying to walk into the campus, we were arrested. Uh, they didn't want to let us in. and well, even just to listen and be in the audience. It's so hideous. That's right, you know, because they control the audience. They carefully control oh, yeah. the audience. They control oh, they the press, do. too. Yeah. So yeah. they did not want a candidate there in the audience that could you know, sort of represent that there was another choice here that, that was yeah. locked out. So they arrested us. They took us to a dark site, a secret location that no one was supposed to know about. Dick Cheney's basement. Yeah, <laughs> God forbid. That's like some Hunger Games type stuff yeah. right there. Yeah, God, yeah that's exactly. Hideous. And you were handcuffed too, right? We were handcuffed tightly to these metal chairs for about seven hours. Oh my uh, we were surrounded by police and Secret Service agents. There were about 16 of them. There were two of us, and then there was another uh, advocate there for Chelsea Manning, who was like the third person who was arrested. It was you know, my running mate and myself and then a Chelsea Manning advocate was arrested in this gigantic sort of converted old police station that was being used as a holding center if there were going to be political troublemakers. So we were considered, you know, political troublemakers for running for office. Other you know? countries must look at that and just say, what the hell? You know, the United States is supposed to be a beacon of democracy and choice and freedom and they arrest presidential candidates. It's, it, it's, it almost it, leaves you speechless. It sure does, you know? yes, right. And it, I think it makes the point why it's not okay to sit back and let this happen, why it's really important for us to support independent politics, to support right. the exercise of our democracy, you know, and to fight to get into the debates, to Absolutely. fight to be heard, and to fight to be the independent press. We have a name for those corporate guys. We call them the O-Press, yep. or the Re-Press, and the D-Press. You know, this right here is the yeah. real press. Yeah. And we're trying. <laughs> yeah. This is you what know. democracy depends no on. No strings attached here, people. <laughs> so I, I kind of I want to ask, um, I mean, what do you attribute to that blackout? I know we talked about how the press is pretty much, you know, controlled and in bed and cahoots with the government. I mean, do they feel that threatened by third parties? That they uh, just do a complete blackout? Well, they sure did, you know, during that uh, debate. And, you know, uh, generally the corporate press... Uh, does very much try to black us out. You know, yeah. the, probably the most publicity that our campaign got during the whole during the whole election was when I got arrested um, wow. for the right. debates. The news, yeah. Yes, and otherwise they're basically not going to cover you unless you force them to do that. But I think you know the revolution is not going to be televised. It's not going to take place inside the Democratic Party or the Republican no. Party. You know, and it's not going to be televised, which is why. It's really important for us to use the tools that we have while we still have them and to force our way into a more open democracy. I think this election comes more at a really critical and historic moment that we've ever been in before. The economy is only more uh, precarious and more troubled than it's ever been as you know, wages are actually declining now. The jobs that have come back are low wage, part-time and temporary jobs. Yeah. The cost of health care and housing is skyrocketing. Forty million young people are locked into debt. You know, what, what's wrong with this picture? You know, and we're squandering trillions of dollars on wars for oil that make us less secure, on Wall Street bailouts, and on tax breaks, or I should say tax favors, for the wealthy few. So you've yeah. got this perfectly insulated firewalled system. The only problem is that it serves about 1% of yeah, the people. Yeah, a very small group of people. And Most people are really hurting. You have a plan for getting rid of uh, student loan debt. I personally have $40,000 for my undergrad in student loan debt. And I know a lot of my fellow millennials and peers who went to school, some of them have 100 grand, 200 grand, you know, depending on where you went and what your situation is. Mm -hmm. So what is the Green Party, uh, Jill Stein, plan for eliminating student loan debt? I mean, what's your take on that? Well, it's pretty simple. If we bailed out the bankers whose waste, fraud, and abuse got us into this mess, who screwed the economy, if we could bail them out to the tune of $17 trillion, don't we deserve, you know, don't, don't our young people deserve to be bailed out? because they were the victims of this waste, fraud, and abuse. They did their part, you know, and I'm speaking to you guys sure. and, and to other millennials. Kind of predatory lending. 
totally predatory yeah, yeah. lending, and you kept your side of the bargain. You did the work, yeah. you did the schoolwork. Oh, yeah, I showed you, up and studied, I did it. I got a couple it. of C's, but I did pretty well. Between well, drinking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Between on the beers. Whole, but you, you're right. You worked you're right. hard, and the bargain was that if you worked yeah. hard and you got the degree and you did well in your courses, that there were going to be jobs on the you other end. A great job at the end of the rainbow. Right. Start but the, paying your loans back. Yeah. <laughs> and the reality is, those jobs are not oh, there. The or if they're there, they are, you know, they are low wage, temporary, and part time. You know, yeah. and yeah. I just know so many college graduates now who are working several, you know, part time, low wage gigs, and yeah. they're barely paying their rent. They're not able to oh, even yeah. pay well, back. Oh yeah, is it rent this week? Gas in my car, food, you know, beer. What am I going to do? Right. What am I not going to get this week? And further, you know, it's not just you, the generation in debt. It's society because society depends on our younger generation to reinvent sure. our economy Innovate and reinvent and, and have our the ability society. to do that and be entrepreneurs and and, and have to that take risks and, and take to risks. have imagination. Sure. And if you sure. are just working some minimum wage job, you're not able to fulfill uh, the role that society depends on you for. So it's you know it's a betrayal really of of trust. It's a betrayal of the role that we need the younger generation to play. And let me just also say that these loans have been bundled and they have been peddled as investment you know, instruments in the same way that mortgages were uh, bundled and peddled. Right. This is a real problem for the economy because so many young people now are not able to pay those loans. They're not technically in default because there are these other things you you know there are these other ways to sort of put your your payments on hold it technically it's not a default but one of these days those holding patterns are going to time out and then millions of people will be in default so the whole investment system again could come tumbling down so this is actually a danger to the economy so the bottom line is that it is a um, you know it's a, it's a it's a recovery package uh, to die for, really, or I should say to live for. You know, it's sure. the perfect recovery package. So it's package. kind of part of the Green New Deal that you talk about. It's a stimulus package, stimulus. exactly. It creates jobs, it creates productivity. Right. Unlike the banker bailout, which just created a lot of gambling well, and a yeah. lot of more risk-taking. It just helped out the well-connected in government sacks, basically, you know. Yes. And, and, and as far as paying for it, I know I joked earlier, just shave a little dandruff off the Pentagon's budget, but it's, it, where the money comes from, I mean, where do you oh, see yeah. the money coming from? Well, in fact, it can be done as a quantitative easing, which is how the Fed paid, paid right. for the uh, bank bailouts. So we could simply implement quantitative easing, which essentially does not require money. It just means the Feds eat it. And, you know, the technical, you know, if you're down in the weeds about this, it means that you've sort of increased the money supply. But for other magical reasons, it turns out to balance out this destruction of the money supply that happened in the, right. you know, in the, in the economic yeah, so it's kinda, meltdown. So I'm just get Hank Paulson to wave his, his hand. It, it, yes. Exactly. That's what happened last time. Yes. It is. I mean, it is. You know, right. You just have the Fed people bless it, you know. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. Well, and, you know. and the bottom line is you have to instruct the Fed right. because they're not going to do it. You know, because no. they're not, they don't care about these guys. The these Fed. aren't bankers. Ron Paul had been, and Rand have been trying to audit the Fed for years. You, uh, they yes. won't even open their exactly. books. Exactly, right. So and the first thing we're going to have the Fed do it, is bail so out you, the students. So you're in support of definitely auditing the Federal Reserve. Oh, of course. Absolutely. And, and I think we need to nationalize the Federal Reserve. It should not be a private well, institution Congress, run for the benefit. It should really be up to Congress, yeah. our money, the power of the purse. Not this That's right. private, it murky, shadowy internationally backed private bank what the Federal Reserve essentially is. Yes, I don't exactly. even know if you even know what it is, really, you know? <laughs> now, how would the, uh, the student loan relief kind of dovetail with your Power to the People plan? What's some of the, what are some of the details on that? Great. So the, the student de canceling student debt is critical because once you've canceled student debt, you have unleashed the social power of a movement. It's, you know, what is it that creates transformational change? It's always young people. You know, whether it was the civil rights movement or the anti-war movement, uh, you name it, social movement, the women's movement. W movements have always been based on the vision and the inspiration and the courage of a generation. And that generation needs to be liberated. In liberating that generation, we kind of liberate all society to begin actually taking our democracy back and doing the things that we need. So that's step one as this part, this power to the people plan. Step two actually is solving the two 
big emergencies. We have an economic emergency, our jobs, our wages. They want to send more jobs overseas now with this next corporate trade uh, giveaway, NAFTA on steroids, NAFTA on crack, as some people call oh, it. TPP. The TPP, oh, the Trans Pacific yeah. Partnership. Oh, yeah. yeah done, this done in total Obama's secret. Obama's been championing that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Been, oh, yeah. oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Obama and, and the Republicans. That's a whole big thing. And the leadership, the Democratic leadership, Nancy Pelosi, well, you know. Leadership. Yeah, right. The misleadership, yeah. I should say. So the heads of the gangs are, are, are pushing for this. Exactly. Now that's their version of, in, in fact, that's as much as they can offer, you know, which is, it's like worse than where yeah, we are now. What are we doing here? That's We're going backwards. That, and they yeah. want more corporate, um, you know, they want more trickle down economics, you know? Oh, yeah. 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 More of, yeah. yes. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Trickles downstream, too. Yeah. Yes. In fact, that's the only thing. Yeah, that bird turd trickle down is what it is. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Pardon my French. Right, right. Wow. Um, so, at any rate, you know, we're saying we need a real economic plan. Okay, so we got that economic emergency, and then we have a climate emergency and a larger environmental and ecological emergency. It's not, you know, it's not only that the climate is melting down, but, you know, uh, the, the oceans are on the verge of collapse. That is the, the aquatic food chain and fisheries yeah. and um, our forests and, uh, you know, our, our topsoil, you, you name it. It also turns out that we're losing 150 species are going extinct every day. We're in what's called this, you know, sixth grade extinction. And the bad news, it's like, if you are the size of a squirrel, you're probably going to be okay. But if you are a mammal, if you're a warm-blooded creature and you're larger than a squirrel, we don't do well in extinctions and we generally sort of wave goodbye. So we badly need to change course here. The predictions right now, by the way, are that the extinctions like climate change are going to be totally out of control um, in the next several decades, barring some transformational change. And I'll just cite one uh, piece of science, and this comes from um, Jim Hansen, who's the granddaddy of climate science. He's never been wrong. He says very controversial things, but he's always been right. Unfortunately, we're living in that age of, you know, um, it's like the reality. Uh, what you is, said has come to come It's to totally pass. come to pass. Again. Yes, I mean, it's like sort of the black swan. We're in the age of the black swan. You know, this is what it looks like when the climate starts melting down around you. Every month now we are setting a record. Every month in... Um, 2015 has been record setting. It's been yeah. the hottest. Um, it's going to be 70 on Friday. Oh God, Here we yeah, are in November, November, almost second week in November. <laughs> right, and and you know that in in the Middle East now they are having what's called a heat index. Heat index is when you combine the heat with the humidity because that's what it actually feels like. Yeah. That's what your body feels. The heat index, hold on to your chair, has been like 164 degrees. Oh. Okay, you know people have been dying by the thousands. No wonder they're so pissed off over there. You're not kidding. Versus, well, that's you know, one reason. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the middle. Drought East, and, but, and starvation, yeah. you know, also feed into this too. And it turns out that's what sort of precipitated things in Syria. I mean, not that that's the only thing, but that you it's know, a big but, part of it, though. And I'm glad you mentioned that. A lot of people well, don't even realize that's part of the crisis. It, it is, and we'll come back to that on its own terms in a moment. But here, just to make the point that where the climate is going is um, quite scary to anybody who's not like brain dead um, <laughs> from the climate or, or from the fossil punch fuels, drug, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> punch drug on fossil ben fuels. Ben Carson's actually followers. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, we're in trouble. And actually, polls show that Americans get this. You know, we get this. People will always rank jobs over climate because they've been misled into thinking you got to do one or the other. The reality is you cannot do one without also doing the other. Exactly. The jobs and the economy will collapse if we don't deal with the climate and and likewise our environment will collapse if we don't take care of people and make sure that the economy is working. So they actually go together and um, the thing that Jim Hansen said that I just wanted to mention uh, is that you know, sea level rise has always been kind of more a theoretical concern because it was always like way off in the distance. You didn't have to worry about Greenland or the Arctic, uh, the Antarctic breaking up in our lifetimes. Well, it turns out that's probably not true. And in fact, it's happening way more quickly now. The science is showing that it's massively accelerating. So now um, the new science is predicting we could see a minimum of 20 feet sea level rise within uh, a couple of decades. So in our lifetimes. Wow. Now, yeah. what'll happen with 20 feet or more Katrina sea level rise? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're looking at like a thousand Katrina's. Exactly, yeah. right. Yeah. 
another way to look at that is you thought Pearl Harbor was bad. It's yeah. now every coastal city is going to be Pearl Harbor, but it's not restricted to just the harbor. It's the entire coast, which means it's basically civilization. Yeah. This is not the kind of thing you want to let, you don't want to let that cat get out of the bag because it's, there's no way How to put it back. How do you go back from it? There's no going back. Exactly. You've got to admit it's real. The science is there, it's real. <laughs> and we're seeing it, you know? Yeah. When we got a drought in California and they yeah. have like one year of water left. Oh, and we got water over there. Yeah, yeah it's crazy. It's exactly. And half of our fruits and vegetables are coming from California. So, yeah. you know, this is all connected. Right. This isn't theoretical. This is yeah, happening. This, and people know it. And in polls, people are really concerned about this. And given a way to actually solve these problems, people will jump at the chance. You know, it's not like people say, no, I just want a job, forget the rest. People are not brain dead like that. You know, yeah. my background is as a medical doctor. In fact, now I say I'm practicing political medicine because it's the mother of all illnesses, uh, if you get what I mean. Yes, yep. <laughs> so in my clinic, nobody ever came in and said, hey doc, just take care of my lungs. Forget my heart, don't worry about my kidneys or my brain or my liver or my nervous system or anything like that. Just focused on that one thing. You know, so people are the same way. We get that we need we need food, we need a climate we can survive and you know, we need not to be having hurricanes and right. and drastic storms and droughts and people get it. It's got to work as a whole. And so, you know, the bottom line is we can solve these two emergencies together and there's enormous public hunger to do that. So how do we do it? Well, we had a Great Depression not so long ago, and they did a thing called the New Deal. Well, we're calling now for a Green New Deal. So it would both solve the emergency of the economy and it would solve the emergency of the climate. Basically, we help jumpstart a lot of jobs, 20 million jobs, so that everybody who doesn't have a job has one. Everybody who's got a part-time job, guess what? Now you got a full-time job. And those jobs are focused on creating 100% clean, renewable energy by 2030 on creating a healthy, sustainable local food system, and on creating public transportation. You do those three things, and you've basically, you know, you, you've turned the tide on the climate problem. This not only addresses climate, it revives the economy, and it makes wars for oil obsolete. Obsolete. We don't even need to be meddling in that. And uh, that, exactly. that kind of leads to the next area I want to touch on, which is foreign policy. Great. And I have to say, um, I've been reading some of what you've said about Israel specifically in that conflict, and uh, I applaud you on that. It takes some serious courage to do that, because for whatever reason, we can't have an honest dialogue in our country about Israel, uh, Netanyahu, their government, the IDF, the way they treat the Palestinians, their, the land grab that's been happening since, you know, essentially the end of World War II. Okay. So um, I'm kind of wondering... Um, to go in a little bit more uh, detail about how you would handle Israel and, and the fact that we do give them $8 million a day exactly. in funding, right. um, would you be in favor of reducing that funding and putting strings if they want to have more funding? And how would you, you know, try to go about brokering peace over there between Israel and Palestine? Great. And this is something, you know, I've certainly given a lot of uh, sure, and I know it, having a Jewish background too. Exactly. And, and so yes. That, you know, right. Very so, incredible voice on this. Really, and I I have relatives who they don't live there year round, but they live there you know part of the part time. Of and yeah, you know I I grew up in a Jewish community and that has lots of uh, connections uh, sure. to Israel, but you know a lot of Jews are now waking up to the fact that this isn't good for Israel no. <laughs> either. This is absolutely unsustainable. So, you know, there's, there's very um, active principled groups, the Jewish Voice for Peace, for example, and others who are really share um, our position. And let me explain briefly, our position in the campaign is that we need to reboot foreign policy, you know, not only on Israel and the Middle East, but really world over. Together. Our approach has been basically to be the uh, bull in the china shop on foreign policy and to seek a position of total domination, economic and military domination of other countries around the world, all of them. And that, you know, we can see how far that's gotten us. Just, you know, look no further than Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Yemen, and Syria. Um, utter, total catastrophe. We are not making ourselves safer, we are making ourselves uh, the pariah, you know, of the world. In Martin Luther King's words, 
you know, the United States has become the greatest purveyor of violence uh, in the world. And our foreign policy has really driven that home. So we need to reboot not only our stance towards Israel, but towards particularly the Middle East. And our, um, our position as a campaign is that we need a policy based not on domination, but on cooperation, and specifically on international law, human rights, and diplomacy. That's going to get us a long way, and that's the only way that we are going to get along and solve these problems. That means that we don't fund war criminals. We don't fund governments that are uh, systematically and massively violating human rights. In Israel and Palestine, of course, there are human rights violations on both sides of the conflict. There always are. But the violations on the part of the Netanyahu government are so staggering, so outrageous, so massively disproportionate in the last several armed conflicts, which have basically been invasions and massacres. Oh, yes. Let's be clear. You These call, aren't you wars. You can't call that a war. It's a These slaughter. are massacres. Exactly. Yeah. You know, the numbers were, some, uh, and these are the numbers over, boy, the last maybe five or six years, even more than that. Something like 44 Israelis have been killed, which is tragic. These were mostly soldiers. Um, on the other hand, there have been many, many thousands, I think it's like 3,000 plus going on 4,000, you know, massive um, numbers of Palestinians killed predominantly, almost entirely civilians. Non-militants. Exactly. Women and loads of children, hundreds of children have been killed. So, you know, the, the human rights violations going on here are totally massive. Add to the fact that there's an occupation going on here. That, and that occupation is also a violation of international law. The occupation, particularly one as brutal and massive as the Israeli occupation is of uh, Gaza and the West Bank, that kind of occupation is a, is a constant, endless provocation. So this isn't going to get settled while the occupation exists. No. Um, <clears throat> and the United States should not be in the business of funding a government that is guilty of war crimes and massive violations of international mm. law. And bulldozing people's houses and taking over the land and basically outright stealing it. Exactly. Denying them of water, of, yeah, of basic a, you know, housing. Water. And, yeah. Yeah, it's it's just staggering what's going on. Collective punishment. Yeah. Um, you know, bulldozing the homes of parents, you know, yeah. or family of someone so, who's thought. So to what be, can be done to not be accused of being anti Semitic and hating on Israel and, and being well, like that when you, you these are all legitimate points that are being raised. And, and let me clarify, but, but, this isn't a policy just towards Israel. This is a right. policy that we would also enact uh, against Saudi Arabia from the get-go, oh, because Saudi Arabia is equally guilty of outrageous Biggest human war rights crimes. violators on the planet. <clears throat> people and they just got put on a commission for human rights with the oh, UN, yes, which, which is, is absolutely so outrageous. Yeah, the yes. way they treat women over there, and you got someone like Hillary Clinton not, not saying much about it, who yeah. takes all this money from Saudi Arabia. The Clinton That's Foundation's right. taking That's millions right. from Saudi Arabia. Right. The Saudis also engage in beheadings, you know, yeah. political yeah. beheadings. Daily, there's, almost daily. there's a young man, uh, a, a blogger, who's... Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, awaiting a, de a death sentence right now, which, uh, you know, hopefully will not happen. Um, but, you know, and, and the U.S. should be screaming about this. Our government should be protesting vehemently. And you have the Saudis that are slaughtering Yemenis right now mm -hmm. in a, you know, an absolute uh, human rights catastrophe that's going on. So, you know, uh, we are not, um, <laughs> we are not uh, exercising religious preference here whatsoever. You know, this is right. about applying international law um, to all comers. And I think sure. Egypt would be another uh, yeah. real consideration here, too, because we're funding Egypt, uh, which has massive human right, rights violations and has sentenced some, what is it, hundreds of people to, to death, uh, you know, who are, who are essentially political prisoners. Yeah. So, you know, um, so that's, you know, in terms of U.S. policy, we make clear from the get-go now so that uh, when we are elected... You know, if we should be elected, um, you know, the Netanyahu government, like the Saudis, are on notice that uh, it's time to seriously clean up their act. Um, 
But in addition, I want to point out that in Israel, there's been remarkable, wonderful work that's been done by Palestinians and by Israelis, by the human rights groups, who've really given the lie to the myth that this is a religious fight. You know, these are groups that have lived together peacefully for, uh, for centuries, and that uh, groups are now working together uh, very harmoniously to promote human rights. And the, the local groups, the grassroots groups, really need to take the lead here. And we would be in the business of doing that, of supporting them and allowing them to help define how we help the um, Israelis who are terrified, uh, but who've become their own worst enemy here. They've become the enemy that they abhor in their human rights violations. Um, but essentially, they are terrified being, you know, little Israel here surrounded by countries of the Middle East. But, you know, they need help being shown the way forward. And we need the human rights groups on both sides here to help define a way forward. You know, there are many authorities now who say that because of the way that Palestine's been carved up, there needs to be a unified solution here, that you can't simply divide the states. And I think there's an argument for that uh, that needs to be taken seriously, that when you have religious states, that fundamentally you're not going to protect their human rights, that if you want human rights protections, you need to have um, non-theocracies, you need to have non-religious uh, and democratic human rights-based governments now. And I think it's really important for Israelis to understand that, um, you know, for Palestinians, uh, you know, to also, uh, who seem to understand that, you know, that theocracy uh, yeah, it's is a dead not, end. Yeah, it's a dead end. Exactly. Get you nowhere. It's a vicious cycle. It pits people against yeah. each other. Yeah. And it doesn't protect human rights. No. So I think that's the way forward. It's not so complicated. It's basically common sense and common decency. Yeah. And we need to stand up and lead the way. Yeah, I think a lot of people would, would share that sentiment really at the end of the day, you know, uh, regardless of what the mainstream, the two parties tell us or, or you know, the establishment there. Um, ch changing gears a little bit, uh, I don't know if, if you heard, but a Monsanto research site was recently damaged by a suspected arson in France. Um, what do you think the implications are of a, of a big organization like Monsanto for the globe, uh, especially with their patent on seeds, their, their number one ownership of seeds, and uh, the way activists and people have responded to that company? I think Monsanto um, creates a very dangerous situation. When you reduce you know, hundreds of varieties of corn, for example, to what is it now, like three? Three types of uh, yeah, three, GMO and three three GMO certified seeds, uh, and those seeds are on a patent, so that they are not self renewing. They have to be, you know, renewed by the corporation. Well, what happens if the corporation goes under? You know, oh, goodbye corn. You know, yeah, <laughs> goodbye so soy. Goodbye cotton. Yeah, yeah um, this is like this defies nature. Nature likes diversity. Nature creates lots of diversity, and the minute you start trampling down on diversity and just selecting one or two winners that the corporation likes. This is a crime against nature, actually, and this, this is extremely dangerous for humanity. So um, I think, you know, GMOs need to be uh, banned until such a time as they are proven safe, but there's no way to prove them safe. They're inherently dangerous. Um, the marriage of GMOs with high dose of uh, pesticides, extremely high levels of pesticides, which have been, that's basically what has been uh, patented into these seeds. That's like most of the great new, you know, uh, engineering here is about making them pesticide tolerant. What does that mean? Right. Tolerant to poison. They're mm. poison tolerant, which means then that farm workers get poisoned, that communities get poisoned, and then there are residues in the food as well that are contributing to our exposures, which are uh, not a good idea. Um, 
We don't have great data to show exactly what happens because we don't make human beings guinea pigs and subject them to controlled tests with poison. So instead we're doing an uncontrolled test and just sort of subjecting people to this willy-nilly out there in the environment there. Yeah, the where you can't really... Exactly. Yeah. And you can't really do the strict science on a strict science. You need rats in a cage, basically. And we don't do that to people for obvious um, ethical reasons. But it's not ethical to be testing inherently dangerous stuff, for which there's an enormous amount of very incriminating data. Um, and until such time as this stuff is proven safe, uh, it should not be out there. It should not be patented. Uh, we need to revert to a natural system of of food. And this is right. part of our Green New Deal, is to create healthy and sustainable food systems that are healthy for the planet, but they're especially healthy for us. And let me just give you one little story about this. This happened in Cuba. When Cuba's oil pipeline went down, when the Soviet Union collapsed, you know, in 1990, uh, suddenly Cuba didn't have oil coming in. Well, what's derived from oil? Fertilizer and pesticides. So suddenly overnight, Cuba had to convert to an organic and sustainable food system. And luckily, their universities were ready to go. They had a blueprint. And <clears throat> they got out the draft animals, and they put lots of people to work doing um, you know, organic farming. What do you think happened to their health? Probably got better. Their economy's right. crashing. You know, yeah. their major trade partner and supplier of uh, all sorts of... The person backing them up, essentially. The exactly. Yeah, they... they their economy's tanking. People are extremely stressed. You would have thought their health would tumble downhill. But in fact, their death rates from diabetes went down 50%. Their rates of obesity went down 50%. Their rates of heart attacks and strokes went down like 25, 35%. So they had a health miracle. And how much did it cost them? Nothing. Zero. <laughs> Zero? How much do we pay? We pay a lot to get sick, basically. You know, we do. We have a. We drugs. don't. We don't have a healthcare system. We have a sick care system, yeah. and we don't pay one trillion. We don't pay two trillion. We pay three trillion dollars a year for a sick care system. Cuba had a health miracle that we can't buy for three trillion. They had it spending zero dollars. How? Right. By moving to a healthy and sustainable food system, by uh, zeroing out their pollution, which is what we will do with the Green New Deal, and by enacting a public transportation system where. For those of us who live in urban centers, suddenly then you can walk and bike without taking your life in your hands. I don't know how it is in New Hampshire, but you can't do it around here. You know, we could get killed by a grizzly bear, but no, <laughs> yeah. we drive everywhere up there because yeah. it's so spread out. Yeah, but, um, yes. Wow, yeah, that all, that all sounds great. All, all it, good things to focus some of our money on. Yeah, you're not and kidding. And, and it pays for itself is the bottom line because the health payback of getting rid of the pollution is so ginormous. It's good for everyone, and, and it's, exactly. it's not what someone would call a socialist thing. It should just be like a pragmatic thing. And as a doctor of medicine, I'm sure you see the correlation between the pollutants in the air totally. and the processed foods that, that our culture has been basically brainwashed from cradle to grave into eating. Exactly. I, mean, I don't know when you started practicing medicine, obviously, to today, how that looks, what the difference back, maybe back before Monsanto had such a stranglehold, people yes. had more, you know, Food, better food on their plate. Exactly. More local. Yeah, local. More local farms. And, and, and you know, there was a change in policy uh, thanks to the uh, wisdom of the FDA. They started approving, they used to call them food-like substances. Yeah. And then they just, and then they just <laughs> yeah. started calling them food. And this was, I think, before GMOs, like but it, it's just like Crazy cockamamie, you know, Franken foods. Stuff that they discovered on accident in a lab. Time, well, and, and then they they yeah. they process the nutrients out of it, and they pack all this fake jazzy stuff into it, which is not good for you. So the bottom line is, you know, it's it's not just GMOs. You know, the GMOs create a variety of health risks, but we know very clearly we subsidize, you know, refined wheat and corn and and all this stuff that makes your blood sugar go like this, et cetera, right. We, we subsidize all the wrong things, basically, to make it cheap to feed animals so that we can fatten up the animals and you know, poison them with antibiotics Pump and them full of all that. steroids. Yeah. And all Bad that stuff, yes, yeah. exactly. And in fact, in the United States, you can trace the development of heart disease 
in this country to when we started confining animals and um, uh, driving them in railroad cars instead of driving them to market um, uh, with, you know, actually on their own, under their own muscle power. Right. So at any rate, we know what's driving the epidemics here in, in the society. And if we had more of a healthy plant-based food system, and that's also why Cuba got so healthy, because suddenly they had to revert to an, an energy-efficient food system, which is basically it's a plant-based uh, food system. So their consumption of meat, especially fattened meat, which is what you get in our, you know, in our uh, industrial agriculture system, um, people got healthy. They just got healthy all by themselves. Yeah. And we can do that, too. And it pays for itself, which is the amazing thing. What's not to love about this? Create the jobs, revive our economy, end, uh, end the climate crisis, make wars for oil obsolete, and regain our health. And the benefit, the economic benefit, is so great from the health improvement, it's enough to pay for the energy transition. Yeah. It's really quite staggering. That's why, you know, to my mind, um, I feel like the public is there, and when they get to hear this story, this narrative that there's actually a way forward here, which, which is just, it's democratic, it helps everyday people, it creates an economy that works for us, it's good for our health, it's good for the climate. You know, it's like people are overjoyed because this is a well-kept secret. The uh, powers that be don't like to share this secret. They like no, people to feel know, like... They want you to be sick. They you want know. you to be sick. Yeah. They want you to be depressed <laughs> because uh, if you're hopeless... Out. Give you more pills and... What are you going to do? You're not going to have any energy to look into this stuff or do anything about it. Yeah. Exactly. If yeah. you are hopeless, you are powerless. Well, they want you to be apathetic. Right, exactly. exactly. Right. If hopeless. you have hope, you have power. And we have the numbers to have the power. And I just want to stress that because we got 40 million young people locked in debt. 40 million is enough to win a three-way race. So we Absolutely. not only have the solutions, we actually have the numbers. And I think the name of the game in this election, and this is also what we're doing differently, going back to your first question, is we are getting out the strategic solution here right from the get-go, which is that if there are young people out there who are listening, you have the power to end your debt by coming out and checking the green box on November 8th of 2016 because you have the numbers and this will be a self-fulfilling prophecy. If word gets out and young people have the ability to get the word out, if that word gets out, there will be no holding you back. There will be no stopping you. Your debt is history if you come out and vote to make it so. Yeah, that sounds awesome. <laughs> Not to mention the 60 million people who didn't vote last time, right? Yeah, 60 million people didn't turn up in 2012 to vote. Exactly. So you're only looking at roughly about 100 million people who did vote. So if even a chunk of that opens their eyes and says, hey, there's something other than Coke and Pepsi in this election, you know? Yes. Now, which election was it that 60 million didn't vote? Was that 2014? Uh, was it 2012? Was it last time? Well, I, I think it was, it was probably, I think it was the 2012 general in May, probably the 2014, too. Oh, midterm. The Mid numbers were huge. Yeah, that didn't people vote just didn't vote. They didn't go out and, to vote. And the numbers keep going down it's because ridiculous. there's nothing to vote for. That's true. When people think it's just yeah, I, dem I Democrats and met, Republicans, there is nothing to vote for. Anybody my age who was like so excited for Hillary or so excited for Jeb, yeah. in conventional wisdom is these two clowns are going to be the nominees. But yeah. no one likes them. Exactly. It's like, what the hell? You know, no, it doesn't no even make sense. For good reason. Why should anybody yeah, screw them, want to you know? support these candidates who have screwed them? Yeah, kick those oh, bums at the curb. For Let's decades. Yeah. They've been ruining our country for decades. People don't even realize that. Really? Know? And who's paying a bigger price yeah. than young people who are carrying the, yeah. the burden on debt, on skyrocketing education yeah. costs, on unemployment, yeah. and on the climate, and which so is collapsing on your watch? And they're so happy yeah. to send our generation to war, their for profit exactly. wars, exactly. and they're laughing about it in exactly. the world. Exactly. Which is why it's time to, you know, forget the lesser evil and fight like hell for the greater good because our lives Absolutely. depend on it. And if young people get the word that they can actually take over this election and ensure that their debt is gone, that they have free public higher education, that they have health care as a human right, and that they have jobs and they can actually be creative and, and, and create the world. And, and you know what I say to people who say I'm one person, deserve. I have no power? I say two words, Edward Snowden. Yeah. And I wanted to talk to you about <laughs> Obama's war on whistleblowers. You know, you got John Kiriakou, oh, Chelsea Manning, You're Edward Snowden, kidding. Julian Assange. What would be a Green Party president's posture towards whistleblowers? 
Oh, these are heroes. Yes. These are heroes. So they deserve the medals of heroes. They deserve compensation. They deserve to be let out of jail and, and, and compensated. They need terrorists. reparations. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, they should be called what they are, which is heroes who rescued our democracy. Those who've broken the law here have been our lawmakers, you know, who have deserved us by, by violating the Constitution and our basic constitutional rights. Yeah. So thank God for our whistleblowers who alerted us to this, you know, this outrage Just that's been going on. criminal racket of, that our government is and, and spying on us and tapping our phones and reading our emails and, and it's just, it, it's, we st I don't even know if we still have really grasped the, the scope of this about what Edward Snowden revealed. Indeed. And Chelsea Manning and it's just, it's unbelievable. And, and you know, the, the information keeps coming out. We just heard yes. from the new Edward Snowden the reality about drones. Yeah, the fact that the drone papers. strikes, 90% oh, yeah. of the yes. drone strikes are, oops, sorry, yep. wrong guy. My bad. But remember, even the 10% were, were people that were just like assassinated. There's no yeah. due process. No, no due nothing, process whatsoever. Nothing, just nothing. purely conjecture. Oh, yeah. It's, is it any wonder that you know that we are public enemy that's number the greatest one out there? In, I tell the, people that's the, the greatest now? recruiting yeah. tool for, for extremism. Totally. Dr drone the drones. Yes. And it's not a policy; it's a tool. People say the drone foreign policy. No, that's yes. a tool. It's a, it's a robot. It's exactly. Someone in a in a bunker somewhere in Colorado playing a video game. Yes. You know, and then Obama. My uncle makes the point. Obama's like the world's greatest hitman. You know, who am I going to kill today? Exactly. You know, it's 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 frightening. It, yes. Or Orwell is rolling in his grave right now. <laughs> And he's you know? not laughing. No, I know. I don't mean he's to crying. laugh. He's Jesus, yeah. it's scary how accurate he was in his predictions and what we've come to. So it, it so is. I, yeah. It's really sounding like uh, you know the Green right. Party and, and your campaign is, is a real true alternative to that. And, exactly. You know, we, we hope that you keep fighting on and, and uh, asking the hard questions and getting out there. So let me also address one other thing, which is when we start talking about foreign policy and the need to end the drone wars to basically dismantle our bases, you know, which exist in, uh, oh, you know. Two, 200 countries, right? Well, we I know. 800 it's, bases. It's, it's, Chris it's, Hedges have said we have about 800 bases unbelievable. around the world, I think. Yes, I think that's right. That's like ballpark I, figure yes. that we know about. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right. These are not doing us any good. And we're calling for cutting the military budget and spending our dollars here at home on you know creating true security and actually once we have you know 100% clean renewable energy nobody needs those friggin wars for oil anyhow so you know this is a policy that needs to be globalized as well um, but in terms of foreign policy one of the questions people always ask when you start talking about cutting the military is well what about ISIS you know what about threats like ISIS so I just want to clarify that ISIS is not rocket science we created ISIS. ISIS is an outgrowth of the utter catastrophe, chaos, you know, just uh, utter depravity that we created uh, in Iraq. It's an outgrowth of the bombings and the random killings Absolutely. and oh, yeah. and pitting uh, oh, warlords against each other yeah. and and uh, religions against each other, which is how we played off Sunnis against uh, Shia. Um, and so you don't fix ISIS by doing more of what created it. If we just bomb ISIS, then we're just creating the next, the next ISIS. You know, we've been in this war in Afghanistan. It's now like the world's longest. It's our longest war. Longest the war U.S.'s history. longest 14 war. Fourteen plus years. That's right. Yeah. And what you see happening in Iraq is really this is one war. You know, this is one global war for uh, hegemony and for control of oil and and global economies. Uh, we're not winning it. And. Uh, Violence is not the solution here. Violence is what created ISIS. Violence is actually what created Al-Qaeda. We created Al-Qaeda by uh, fighting the Russians in Afghanistan and creating a jihadist resistance. We trained Osama bin Laden. We armed the Mujahideen, we Charlie sure Wilson's totally war. Did. It's all yes. right there. Yeah. Yes, it totally is. So you don't want to repeat that cycle. So then, well, what do you do about, if people accept that, you know, we don't want to create the next ISIS, what do you do about the current ISIS? Well. Here's what we can do. It's like the elephant in the room. It's our allies who've been funding ISIS. It's Saudi Arabia, largely, who's been funding ISIS. So you know what? We get our allies to stop funding the critters. And then 
you know, and, and then it's the oil that ISIS is selling on the black market to our allies, including Iraq, right. that are buying the oil. So how about we get our allies to stop buying ISIS's oil? Then how about the militias that keep crossing over Turkey's border? Well, you know what? Turkey closed its border not all that long ago to immigrants. If they closed their, their border to refugees, I think they could close their border to ISIS and, and to the, mili the, the militias crossing the border. And then finally, arms. Where does ISIS get its arms from? Hello. You know, it's mostly us. Uh, we are the biggest so arms dealer in the world. We are the, we our supply leftover equipment, too. Our leftover, our lost equipment, all the guys that defect. Remember, we just spent, <laughs> yeah. uh, what was it, a billion dollars? Oh. Uh, something half a billion billion. I don't recall exactly what it was, but it's a lot of money. We just spent training, you know, the moderate head choppers. You right. know, yeah. so they say the moderate, the moderate yeah. ones. Yeah. The moderate ones. Moderate well, it turns trees. out the moderates. There are five of them now. You know, for these hundreds of millions of dollars that we spent, there are now five of them, and so they they take off and their arms go. Um, you know, we supply eighty percent of the arms now to the Middle East. We can work with the Russians on this, and I'll bet if we approach this as an honest broker, and Russia has actually been offering to set up peace talks with Syria, you know, since at least uh, 2012, uh, and offering to move Assad aside as part of these peace talks. So this has been going on for quite a while. They've been making this offer. Uh, long before we began bombing, which hasn't done a whole lot of good in the whole year that we've been doing it. And the boots on the ground that we've now added, you know, is just like outrageous after 16 promises from Obama that he was not going to put boots on the ground in Syria. Now we got boots on the right. ground We're and this advisors. is a slippery slope. <laughs> right, just advisors <laughs> just who are, advisors. Who, who knock on the door in the middle of the night. These yeah. are the special ops advisors. Just 50 advisors. special operative guys. They're, right. They're nice. Yeah. They're nice. Yeah. Advisors we had in Vietnam, you know. <laughs> before Johnson escalated it, so. Exactly. These it goes are, on. These are the boots as much as they get. The point is, we can uh, establish an arms embargo. That would be like the best thing to happen to the Middle East. Establish an arms embargo for the purpose of cutting off arms and ammunition to ISIS, which would basically cut off arms and ammunition to everybody if we created an arms embargo. So, you know, the point here is that we have control with our allies over the support and the funding and all that for ISIS. So we can starve ISIS. We don't have to bomb ISIS. We can conveniently and strategically and surgically starve ISIS and you know, decompress this outrageous, catastrophic situation that's not going to get better if we keep doing what is fanning the flames and pouring more gasoline on it. So you know, the bottom line is it's not rocket science to figure out how we can uh, you know, create a world that works for all of us for us in America and for us around the world. We can have uh, a world that puts people, planet, and peace over profit. The power to create that world is not just uh, a thing of hopes and dreams. You know, we have the power to create that world right now. It's right here. It's in our hands. We can do it. We've got the numbers. We got the solution. Let's make it happen. Go to jill2016.com and uh, Let's show them the unstoppable force that we will be. Beautiful. Dr. Jill Stein, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Green Party candidate for president 2016. We wish you all the luck. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your coming all the way down Absolutely. here. Absolutely. And I hope to see you uh, on a stand-up comedy here before too oh, yeah. long. Oh, yeah. We'll be up there. Maybe. Maybe in Trump Tower. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe we'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> so this has been a special video presentation of Jackman Radio. We hope you guys have enjoyed it. Uh, again, uh, check us out on iTunes and jackmanradio.podbean.com and on Facebook and on Twitter at Jackman Radio. Thank you very much.